We have units that we call species that are byproducts of evolution, that they exist regardless we recognize them or not. They don't have problems among them. One species of fruit fly will recognize its mate. The problem is for us, that we want to recognize the units that exist in nature, that really exist. And we have to have some kind of clues that help us to identify that. Concepts, what, it, what are doing is to help us to find these special clues that indicate that these units that we are recognizing are real. We, we, we want to, we, we don't know if those typological species, come those morphometrics, are defining real evolutionary units. We, we, we know that they are different because of measurements of whatever. We don't know if the species we're recognizing because they interbreed and they produce offspring are real entities in, in nature because hybridization can happen among almost anything. And not almost anything, no. But, but the, the, the point is, we need to have that clue. The, the other problem is, we have these, these units in nature that we have to recognize, that we want to recognize. But also that we have to name, because we're describing biodiversity. And if we are describing the real thing, we put names to the real things. And what we are seeing here uh, that we, is that we have a, disba a disbalance. We name things that may not be correspondent with the, the units that exist in nature. And as biologists or scientists interested in biodiversity, we want a perfect match. We want the thing that we name represents an evolutionary unit. For example, I found finally the words for my first example. We want to name taxa that are evolutionary, evolutionary units. And for higher level taxa, it's a set of species that share a common ancestor. They are monophyletic. We want to do this work because once we recognize that these units are monophyletic, we, na we have now the product of evolution, the real product, an estimate of the real product of evolution. And we, we found a name for it. And the name helped us to understand that this thing is something that is relevant for the evolution and for biodiversity. Family Siconidae means that the group of species that belong to that share a common ancestor. And order falconiforms, whatever, doesn't happen that clear with the species. Because for higher taxa, we have a very easy way to know that they are monophyletic. They share a common ancestor. <laughs> for, sorry. Well, that's, that's a phylogenetic dance. <laughs> Sorry. And look, when you do a major revision, a new, a, new, a new information suggests you that the, or the, the groups that you were recognizing were not right. You have to change everything. And you have to rename and recognize that, for example, these three sets, uh, this, this set of three columns are are de depicting three different classification systems. And when you see the colors, for example, let me find one. This group was monophyletic for all of the classification systems. But this group It's totally different with the, with the new approach. We have to change. We have to represent the real, the real, the real pattern of evolution. For species, we're looking for that. We want to find a concept that allows me to recognize the real 
entities that exist in nature, the real entities that we, I have to analyze to describe biodiversity, and we still are not in a, in, in a point that we can decide which is the, the best concept. But we are going to discuss that and come back, come back to the concepts a little later. Given that we have those many approaches and those many concepts about what a species is, and the, the problem, believe me, is crucial. Crucial is a word in English? Yes. So we are working with species, I insist. How can we not know what a species is? How can we not get into, <laughs> into an agreement how many species are of any taxon? But, but here's an example. Again, again, birds, again, Mexico, and you hate Mexico, and you hate birds, and you hate me, and town, and everybody else. However, we have at least these five classification schemes for Mexican birds. And all of those are used. And all of those are present in publications, and are present in, in research, and are present in the endangered species lists. So it's messy. And we have classifications that were produced by a bird watcher, a British bird watcher, that decides, uh, Stefan, that, oh, that's a different species. That's a different species. Right. <laughs> and, and this guy publishes a, a, a field guide with a totally changed taxonomy. We have the old approaches, we have new approaches, but each, each classification scheme has its difference. The thing is that we have this, the, this is publication, the checklist of North American birds. This is like the Olympus. It's a bunch of guys that sit, have, have a beer, and decide what is a species or, or what is not a species of bird in North America. This, this nice, nicely conformed committee. Instead of being what, innovative, instead of, of being prone to change, this committee works on this premise, following the time honor tradition of, 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 uh, of previous committees, conservative and cautious. That, that is, they will stand, they will maintain as possible the all points of view for the classification of birds. Now I'm going to tell you a story. Imagine the last 25 years of my life with your teacher of the two days before. <laughs> See, he, 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 told, he has told you that we have been together working in natural history museums, making databases of the birds of Mexico and everything. You will hear it again and again and again, I'm sorry. But we were lucky because we were able to do something that no many people has the opportunity to do. Because when we started the work, the digitalization of the collections were really not, not, not in the point that is now. We were able to see the specimens. So each data that we captured came from a label that was in the, in the feet of a, of a dead bird for many years. And what we saw is that once we were capturing data, we detected variation that was not reflected in the classifications we were using to do our database. So we say, hey, look, what, 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 what is this? So what, what can we do to, see, to, to change this? Moreover, we, we detected that most of the variation, that the, this is an overall morphological variation that we detected, were consistent with geography. So that we have this set of, of, 
of uh, populations that uh, presented certain uh, certain group of characters restricted to a geographic area. So I said, okay, why don't we be more more modern and work to produce a new classification of the person? We only have five. A sixth one is not harm is harmless, right? So what we did is make a revision of all the species of birds of Mexico following a criteria of thinking that the populations that exhibit a set of characters that allow us to identify as different will be considered a different species. We analyzed more than 1,000 species of Mexican birds when we saw specimens of all of them. We use as a basis of comparison a species that were defined by the biological species concept that is the concept that the committee of the checklist uses. And we produce this beautiful work that is called an alternative species taxonomy to the birds of Mexico by Adolfo Antown from here is the Fofis Town Taxonomy. I am Fofis. <laughs> His town, so that's FT taxonomy. So I will I will refer as FT. We did our job. It was years and years of analyzing data of fighting. Can you imagine that we were fighting, right? It's, it's not a surprise. And finally pr produce a paper that was sent to the major ornithological journals in the world. What happened? It was rejected, rejected. It was like a, like a baseball game. See, home run, home run, or cricket game. No? Cro cricket? Cricket, yes, cricket must be here. Finally, it got accepted in this obscure Brazilian there's the journal that is an internet, Biota Neotropica, but finally it appeared. What happened here? We have 1,000 species of birds for which, for 323 of which, no, 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 sorry, sorry, for 135 of which we detected differences, evident differences that led us to, to think that they were different species. Of those more than 100 species that were split, we produce a total of three, 323 species, 120, 122 of which are new endemics. What does it mean? Applying a different approach to the taxonomy of a well-known group, we get to major changes in the understanding of biodiversity. We increased the number of species known to Mexico in almost 200 species. And we increased the number of endemic species, the biopolitical endemics restricted to Mexico, on 122. But what is also very important is that we found a very consistent pattern of splitting species. Look, this is the, the number of species and this, this is the number of species in which each species was split. For example, we split four species into one, split into one, is because when we made the, the, the separation of the, two, of the two taxa, one was outside Mexico and one was in Mexico. Okay, so that is why it was split in one for Mexico. 92 of those species that we analyzed were split in two species within Mexico. 24 were split in three species, and that such and such until one in five and one in six. So that means that at least a, a, a great amount of the biological species in Mexico are not, rec not well recognized. You can imagine that, but what? 
Just a comment. Come over here. Ah, you need to comment close to me. The comment is that Mexico had seen a lot of taxonomic attention in the middle, middle 20th century from schools of taxonomic thought that tended towards the splitting end. So we only changed 13, 14% of the bird taxa in Mexico. Africa, in general, in the bird taxonomy world, one, hasn't seen much recent attention, and two, has always fallen within a taxonomic school of thought that was much more towards the lumping end. So anything that Adolfo is showing you right now, if you take any substantive region of this continent, my guess is that it will be even more dramatic. So that histogram, those bars are going to shift to the right. So what he's showing you is really, really, really relevant to your own situations. You think you have five endemic species of birds or herbs or fishes in your country. You may have 50. Okay? So watch this carefully. It's awfully interesting. Gracias, Mwasit. Marketing, yes. Okay. So as, Ta as Town is pointing out, this is relevant. Let's look at the ra raw numbers. For bi bi biological species concept, 1,069 species. For the well, I had to tell that we use a phylogenetic evolutionary species concept to produce our taxonomy. We have 1,257 species. I'm having trouble with the numbers. Oh my gosh. Okay. From almost 100 biological species endemic, we raise the number to 245 endemic species in Mexico. Is that relevant for? Or biodiversity studies? Gosh, it's amazing. Now, we were happy. What can we do with this framework? What we do is to receive hits in the head. We, we thought that because the paper was published in this obscure Brazilian journal, nobody will, would care about it. But the guess who answered the first? James Van Rensen, the head of the checklist of North American Birds Committee. This ugly guy. <laughs> but this guy <laughs> lacks a little red hair here. <laughs> okay. Van publish a critique on our work saying, okay, thanks, thanks so much for your work, <laughs> but, but you're, you did it wrong. You're doing the same way that it was done 100 years ago, so please shut your mouth and keep collecting birds and, and doing databases. <laughs> 